Um, this is my best foreign. I like to talk to students, and I was told most of you are students. So um, what I'm going to tell you today is, um, first, disclaimer: I'm not a computational biologist. I don't know how to write code. However, I hope my goal, my, my purpose of being here is to attract you to uh, identify interesting, exciting opportunity and, and challenges for your young, smart students to engage upon. So everybody actually experience the biology benefit. So today I wanted to talk to you about uh, the interesting challenges and exciting opportunities engaging sequencing area. And I'm going to use two actually interesting stories to um, explain how the structure affected sequ uh, functions of our genome and in fact uh, uh, understand how the genome regulation is about. So uh, I think, I hope this is not something you, new to you. Um, in the last two, more than two decades, sequencing has really fundamentally changed how we study genome and how do we study genetics. And in fact, uh, it ranged from individual biomedical application to population study, from looking at the different uh, structure changes to chromatin organization to open or chromatin accessibility to how DNA or histone modification and how does it translate to gene expression and RNA expression. So a full range of uh, type of uh, phenomena in the genome can be assayed in, in, through sequencing. Um, similarly, in the last two decades, there's a, a rapid, there's, I mean, in my view, it's not rapid, but um, <laughs> for your young kids, probably is in a, a very uh, uh, steep evolution of the sequencing technology from the early on Sanger used for most the human genome sequencing to a range of second generation platforms starting they comes and goes and um, four by four Illumina people actually in my age uh, appreciate the hypes and the down when they come and go. And, and now in the last couple of years, the new excitement coming from the third generation single molecule long beat sequencing, which I wanted to touch upon and then tell you what we can use those uh, single cell, uh, third generation. However, as a genome biology technologist, the goal is trying to maximize the utility and advantage and um, uh, overcome the limitations of there. So, um, in the um, uh, approach that we try to do, so this is the context of what I'm going to share with you, is uh, a structure. Um, the genome structure are two levels. One is the primary structure, how sequencing is actually arranged in the genome. <coughs> Second level of structure is once the primary sequence is in order, how they actually be folded in the genome so the genome can properly carry out its function, which is mostly transcription regulation, replications, um, mitosis, and, and DNA synthesis, DNA repair. So all these are very interesting, the way how the genome structure is critical. And, um, sorry, the slides again. So um, in order to maximize the past I would say over a decade of short read based analysis. We have uh, developed, and my, my, and we, in these five groups, and my colleague have developed a series so called pair and ditax sequence analysis strategy. So, the pair and ditax sequence strategy is because the sequencing read length is short, and there's no technology we can sequence entire reads from the beginning to the end. The ability of we uh, maximize the short reason. What if we sequence any DNA fragment from the very beginning and very end in the short text? And using the reference genome as, um, uh, as a backbone, we map to the genome, then we can know the entire content. This is what we maximize the utility of the short reads. And then using so called the transcriptome as a DNA, uh, cDNA as a backbone or chromatin immunoprecipitated DNA fragment as a template, or actually concatenated DNA fragment to subject to 454 sequence, or using the chromatin interaction in a fragment as a backbone, or DNA fragment backbone. So different backbone, when you sequence the end 
of both ends. Map to genome can give you the entire DNA fragments. And I'm going to share with you one of the uh, methods to look at the chromatin interaction. So in the, in, the, in the genome, the DNA actually are packed in a very orderly fashion. And a certain DNA actually contact DNA to make uh, specific transcription regulation. For example, uh, enhancer versus the promoter. So how do we analyze it? Um, people are probably familiar with high C, which is approximate measurements of DNA contact. Here we also have a method similar to high C, but we call quantity immune precipitated uh, interaction analysis. So in the DNA, when we cross-link the cell, SNAP frees the interaction fragments. Um, then we add an adapter on the end of the DNA, carry out proximity ligations, and then break the cells, and then pre immunoprecipitate by antibody of your protein of interest. <coughs> Pull down those immunoprecipitated fragments, and then be cross-linked to remove the protein complex, and sequence those DNA pair end by Illumina show me sequence. And once it actually get mapped to the genome, for a specific chromatin immune precipitate fragment, you can actually delineate the protein binding peaks. And their connectivity tell you which fragment with which region actually come together in a cross proximity in the 3D nuclear space. And more importantly, the non precipitated over, uh, overall population of approximate ligation fragment can tell you overall high order from so called chromatin conformation, chromatin topology. So, for example, here we conducted the chip analysis from um, IPS, which is a pro protein cells, cardiomyocyte, which is a lineage defined <coughs> cardio uh, 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 heart cells. And then glioblastoma, which is a neuronal sphere cells, actually is a tumor generated, very notorious, uh, uh, very notorious tumors. We can actually look at specific genes and their interaction with the region of the genome and the specific regions of the uh, genome. But more than that, we can look at, for example, this is the entire chromosome one. We can actually look at their contact key maps. So in this case, uh, regions of high, high connectivity will form so-called the region of he high heat map, suggesting those regions are actually form uh, on close interactions. So <clears throat> using that, we can go ahead and ask how the chromatin is compartmentalized in the, in the cells, in the nucleus, and how that compartmentalization affects transcription regulation. So there are, um, these are the earlier published paper, and that, that's something you can read about, I'm not going to talk about. Um, whatever I talk about are our published data, which is, uh, I think that's more exciting. And then, but the idea is that when the nuclear, when the chromosome are compartment genomes, there's active transcription factor domain that can be actually studied by RNA polymers too. There is also repressive compartmentalization domain, which can be studied by polycom, which is a repressive complex. And there is like an intermediate insulating complex, or so separate these two complex, it's called CTCF. So our lab actually has performed CTCF chiapet and RNA-PO2 chiapet, looking at the insulated interactome and the RNA-PO2 transcription active interactome. However, we know the genome is not just being active. There is also a delicate balance between transcription activation and transcription repression. So it is like an yin and yang in the whole nucleus. You need to properly activate certain genes. You also need to make sure certain genes are properly turned off. So our goal in this study is trying to understand how this so-called um, compressed, uh, repressive gene compartmentalized uh, region looks like. Uh, we call it polycom body. And that it can actually is not an imaginary compartment. It can be observed through some sort of imaging based cyto, uh, um, uh, microscopic anal uh, uh, staining analysis. So, what we did is we take the three key cofactor in a polycom complex, namely PED, SUSI 12, and EZH2. And then we perform the Chiapa analysis independently showing they're highly correlate in terms of the pattern, in terms of the mapping profile. Then we combine the entire so-called three-factor um, 
chromatin interactome to form the so-called PRC interactomes. The PRC2 interactome on the linear genome on the so-called uh, anchor to anchor actually compile several different patterns. First of all, we have a majority of them, one third of them, are like connection between promoter and promoter. Um, an example of promoter promoter interactions are shown here. So multiple loop uh, genes um, reside in the same genomic regions are uh, uh, repressed in the uh, pluripotent cells being connected um, into uh, through, through the polycom complex. Secondly, we have seen a lot of so-called gene looping within individual gene. For example, this is one gene promoter and the transcription stop size. We see the entire looping happens within genes. That also accounts for a huge, um, almost one third of regions. The rest of actually promoter connect to intergenic regions, upstream or downstream, suggesting some of non-coding region, maybe through this looping control is expression. Then we see also a small percentage connecting between intergenic and intergenic non-coding region. So we also showing those, if we take the genes, and most of the looping actually happen in the promoter. So this is the Inter, uh, interaction frequency across the genes that involve in the interaction. We see the peak regions actually most highest in interaction frequency happens in the promoter. It's probably suggested by a lot of promoter promoter interactions. <coughs> and secondly, all the genes that involve interactions compared to genes without inter involved interactions have a less expression level uh, showing with our PKM, uh, as an RHD expression counts. So this is established the fact. Genes are involved in intera interaction as mostly through their promoter. Secondly, when genes involve interaction, they tend to be transcriptionally suppressed. So this is the model we're trying to uh, hypothesize. Like if transcription activation can be exerted through promoter interact with in cancer, can that be there is a transcription silencers that mediated by a uh, polycom as a transcription repressor, when binding to the silencers, uh, link those prom uh, gene promoters subject to silencing. And we went ahead to test that hypothesis through a CRISPR, -Nac -Nac uh, CRISPR Cas9 knockout. So this is the intergenic regions that mediated lots, lots of gene connectivity um, in, in the CDKN1 and the KO, uh, it's the imprinting regions very important for embryonic stem cell development. So in this region, we have a 10 kb re uh, in anchor region, um, exemplified here. We perform CRISPR-Cas9 knockout and to delete this region. And then and we cross those mouse and then get a blastocyte um, uh, sites, um, early embryonic cells, and select for embryonic stem cell uh, with the homo, homo, homozygous knockout of this region. And we did RNA-seq analysis and asked all these connected genes what their RNA expression looks like. And it is what we expected. In the two independent ES clones with these two RNA-seq uh, with two, these two regions knocked out, in the two independent clones, compared to the wild type, all the genes that actually connect to these non-coding anchors show transcription reactivation suggesting this region is important to keep those genes in the silent states in the um, embryonic stem cell. Similarly, we don't want to um, just test one, we test two. So this, we pick another region, also have a very busy interaction to lots of genes. In, in this region of 10 kb anchors, we perform knockout. In this case, Similarly, we show all the genes connected to these anchors have transcriptionally reactivated. More than that, not only the gene connected to this anchor being transcriptionally reactivated, we see a global gene expression activations. Here is compared to the knockout cells versus wild type cells. This is the RNA uh, expression volcano plot. And we see majority of the differential expression genes are actually being activated. In fact, none of the genes uh, are show transcription repressed, suggesting these genes, these regions, the non-coding regions, are important to silence lots of genes in the genome. 
And then what's the effect of those deep repression in the mouse looks like? So we went ahead actually to, um, made those mice to create a homozygous. And interestingly, we could not find any homozygous embryo that's live to birth. Majority of them actually, in fact, 100% of the uh, homozygous knockout are dead. Um, um, in, uh, the heterozygous and wild types are mostly viable. And to find out when do they die, so we went ahead and started from the most early stage of the embryo, 9.5 days after their uh, um, zygote formation. And we find that in the wild type, the, cell, uh, the embryo actually developed properly, but in the homozygous mutants, the embryo showed delayed development, suggesting when reactivate the genes that's supposed to be silenced, you really perturb uh, the proper developmental process. So this is showing the way of technology. I can, can tell you how you can uh, um, identify important elements in the genome as silencer. And this silencer carries interesting histone modification patterns. And the most drastic histone modification, this silencer anchor carries are a co-modification of K27 trimethylation, which is the repressed mark, also <coughs> K20, uh, K4 monomethylation, which is so-called poise mark. So poise meaning they are not active, but they're not completely repressed. So it just gives us the suggestions that maybe they somehow keep those regions silenced, but not completely break. There's a one, it's like a when you drive a car, you have one step, one foot on the brake, and you have one foot on the, um, Yes. So then we went ahead and asked what those anchor regions um, change when the cell so-called differentiate into specific lineage. In this case, we look at two lineages, liver and forebrain. We show uh, those anchor regions, a part of them actually start carrying out active transcription enhancer bar, K27 acetylation. Suggests that in this silencer, Although it acts as a silencing element, when the cells start to differentiate into lineage specific, a part of them can regain and activate enhancer marks and become an enhancer. And then we further went ahead showing, using the public database, showing some of the region in fact not only carry an active enhancer mark, but they actually indeed, uh, as an enhancer, <coughs> uh, 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 activity in the reported assay. Here is a mouse heart uh, showing active reported assay in the mouse heart. This is an active mouse brain showing activity uh, in the mouse brain as an enhancer. So um, and then we went ahead and scanned for 20, um, uh, so, sorry, 74 different cellular states across 14 different cell lineages and showing a subset of those actually become an uh, uh, enhancer carrying the H3K27 enhancer mark. So this is telling me that gene regulation in the genome are not um, static. They can be a transcription silencer at one point in time. When the situation change, conformation change, active transcription start binding, they can move into the transcription enhancer. So genome regulation is very versatile. They're very um, uh, plastic, and they can they don't have a certain uh, so-called static signatures. Lastly, we take those anchor regions. They start merge them and to form to form uh, transcription networks. So specifically, we ask if in the three-dimensional space using the connectivity. Uh, uh, information, can we reconstruct a three-dimensional genome uh, structures? And then that actually will tell us where those polycom heavily interact nodes reside, and how their uh, re reside cluster contains what are the genes. So this is the typical surface plot, showing a connectivity networks when it group together in the genome, actually co-aggregate all the developmental regulated genes together in, in the genome. And then we, we didn't stop here because I want to, we actually constructed a real three-dimensional, so 
um, I want to, before I show the movie, I want to give you some uh, way to read. So individual chromosomes are represented by individual lines of different colors. So we have the 22 chromosomes to 22 different colors. They have been occupied in the entire nuclei, nuclei, nucleus in a different so-called chromatin territory. It's like in your suburb neighborhood, you have a different uh, town. Now, we start putting into the polycon hubs and ask how they actually form, where they actually come, uh, uh, aggregate. And this is the, uh, this is the, okay. this is the three dimension. So we first turn those chromosome region and can zoom in the biggest hub. And then guess what we find in the biggest hub? Oh, those hubs, genes. They actually form into biggest hub that contains multiple developmental regular genes together in, in a hub region. So with that information, we start asking, can we ask the relative location of the genes in this three-dimensional nuclear space? And the example we choose are chromosome 6. Chromosome 6 has two genes. One is Hux A, which is completely silenced in embryonic stem cell. One is nano, which is completely active. In, they both are chromosome six, and, 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 and reasonable this business. So we ask in the three dimension nuclear space, where do they reside? So nano we find are very much to the center of nuclear nucleus. Hox A being repressed are very much in the peripheral of the nucleus. And in fact, the distance of them to the center of nucleus are actually multiple fold between the ratio of, uh, to the center of Hux A to the ratio of nano. In fact, Hux A is a couple fold distance away from the nuclear center. And uh, if we take all the active genes in the chromosome 6 compared to the repressed gene on the chromosome 6 and ask well, how much are they crowded, in fact, Hux active genes in the uh, chromosome 6 are residing in a heavily crowded area in the center of the nucleus where the repressed genes in the nucleus are resided in the low crowding area in the peripheral of the nucleus. This is probably a way to explain how they actually be transcription activated, being a different region. So this is coming back to the compartmentalized uh, the, the, uh, methods. So um, I still have uh, so, um, so this is the example showing how we use short reads and maximize the read length to study uh, comedy conformation. Next, I want to touch, instead of the secondary folding, what's the actually primary sequence structure, which is the structure variance. And the structure variance not only affect cancer, affect a variety of different uh, uh, so-called developmental disease. In fact, uh, it was proposed that although individual sequence homology identity between individuals are very high, 99.9%. In fact, the structural variation account for probably the remaining differences between gene, my genome and your genome. However, this area has not been well uh, extensively ex explored because the methods to look at those structural variations are mostly done by the short reads. So how does short read to look at structural variation? Sure, you look at structural variation mainly by two ways. One is a short read spans through the breakpoints. The genome has been so-called structural variant has a breakpoint. You can either use that information to derive structural variation, variation information, or you can read the genome uh, DNA sequence and use the two ends mapping back to the reference genome, so-called the discordant mapping. Um, whether they map too far away, too close, or on two different chromosomes to infer, again, my words infer. You don't really know what happened in between. You just use the two-way ends map to the reference to tell you there might be a structure differences between this sequence and the reference genome. So what is the problem with that? Um, firstly, the chance of your end reads split, uh, spans through the breakpoint is rare. Therefore, people generally do 20x, 30x, or even 60x coverage in order to have confident reads span through that uh, breakpoint. Second, short reads mapping, particular to the repeat region or low complexity regions, 
are very not accurate. So those repeat region or low compressive region structure variation pretty much is very hard to define through short reads. Thirdly, you, you use the pair ends to look at the discordant mapping in further translo uh, re uh, structure variation. You know there's a structure variation, but you cannot tell exactly what's happening in between because there's no way to sequence it. So the resolution is low. You still <coughs> know there's something happening in between, but you don't know exactly where. So, um, third, uh, lastly, I, I, can, I can name a lot, but I just... <laughs> lastly, cancer genome particularly, structure variation are complex. That there's a multiple, usually a structure variation does not happen alone. When you have something goes wrong, there are different kinds of structure variation. So deletion can co-occur with insertion or translocation. So this complex structure variation, you show me you, you just have a hard time to find. So now, um, uh, so this is the scan, this is the uh, estimate of different kinds of structure variation and their regions, length distribution. So if you look at the most well-studied genome, NA12878, and analyze what their structure variation detects so far, their distance, they are between really 10 kb and 100 kb, so really in a very tight region. So meaning structure variation of very small or structure variation very large or even complex are completely uninterrogated, not being done. So there is a big room, this is a, also a big challenging and exciting to find those. Um, one thing I want to introduce you, the next generation nanopore sequencing. Um, I think, um, let me, so, so how does this sequence? <laughs> so it actually used, is a very simple physics. It used a pore, and then uh, it's a biological pore. It's an E. coli membrane protein. It's good to zip through the DNA through. And it's having a pore sitting in an ionic buffer, like salt. When there's nothing goes through, and then you apply, an, uh, you apply a voltage. Where the pore is empty, the iron, four, iron, uh, iron flow then through smoothly. You don't create much current because there's no resistance. When the DNA goes through, you create a resistance. There's a current. And it depends on the DNA sequence context how it goes through, it creates a different pattern of that current change. And then using that pattern signature, you start to tell what kind of sequence A or T or C or G. See, so first of all, it only requires salt, and salt buffer is very cheap. Second, you can read DNA sequence when it's actually going through pool. You can really read DNA in the real time. Third, it does not require polymers to synthesize DNA wire to do sequence. So there's no enzyme, there's no dependence on enzyme chemistry. So it's quick. In fact, the speed of DNA goes through the pool, right now they're doing is one second for about 500 base pair. So per second, you can read half of the KB. So that means you can read many DNA sequence very quickly. Therefore, it does pretend the potential of being quick and being cheap and being very um, uh, uh, versatile, meaning you can do it anytime, uh, anywhere. It's, it's just basically a pop up. Okay, so with that understanding, the challenging of generating long sequence is not in the, this device. It's really how you prepare long DNA to make it go to the pool. Because if you can make sure your DNA is long, it will give you a long sequence. However, um, you guys are probably too young to realize prepare long DNA is not very easy. It's probably going back to early days when we sequence in the backbone. Is how to maintain hundreds of KBs and even megabases size DNA intact in the tube without being damaged. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to do a little commercial. We're running a long read workshop every year. If you're interested, we have a hands-on tutorial course. Uh, students can come there very cheap and learn how to do it. And we make sure, we guarantee you do a hands-on. It's not you sitting here listening to me talk. But anyway, we have a two, we have a very uh, old-fashioned way to uh, isolate DNA. You probably never 
How many of you are isolating like before? How many of you just do to kit? Most of you, I assume, right? So this is a really old fashioned. Um, uh, in the old textbook, you lice the cell, you do some organic extraction, then you start using a glass roll. You start stir, stir, I see some, and I go, okay, you're probably at the same age as I do. I can't tell age that way. <laughs> then you start some of the things that are aggregate. So those are really high molecular DNA, but they're very hard to work with. They're very gunky, they're very, so you have to be careful, you have to cut the tips, you have you know, no pipetting, no spinning, um, anyway. No. And then we down through this on minor DNA fragmentation using some sort of needle. So we got let go through needle a couple of times. Uh, we add in an adapter, we can go through sequencing. And this is the sequencing profile. If you're not done this in the short end view, people probably you probably cannot appreciate. It. Our average M50 reads is about 50 to 60 kb. So this is a M50 reads at 50 to 60 kb fragment length. And then I'm not just showing you as one run. Sometimes people get one run and post this, and we did this. This is a collection of almost 70 runs that we've done with maximum read length and 50, around 50 KB in the quality score there in the individual read level. So I, I, the reason I show you is not just tell you how good we are. I'm just trying to convince you, and it is real time, and you can't actually start thinking about using this to do. So, these are the examples um, uh, we've done um, to use the long read to detect complex structure variation. Again, I want to emphasize that. We want to maximize the value of long reads. And we think the best way to max maximize the long read value is detect complex ones. Because those are hard to be able to detect through short reads. So here, this is the read. We have, see this is a deletion, and there's a duplication, and this is the inversion all happen in the same regions. Similarly, here, here's a, a duplication with insertion happen in the same region. So again, thinking about this kind of complexity, how you can see this. And that complexity really is a signature in our experience of cancer genome. So it is not just one cancer we study. In fact, cancer genome is highly complex. There's those complex. And this is the translocation late reads between chromosome 7, chromosome 20, and chromosome 2. And this is a 35 read, KB reads, give you that kind of information. And lastly, I want to show you this. Not only the reads give you complex, they also give you, it's a read directly read through the, the breakpoints and give you like base resolution where the breakpoint occurs. So it can, can tell you exactly where the unit breaks. It can allow you to and, and characterize the breakpoint um, uh, characteristic. Uh, the, uh, because of the time, I wanted to. So uh, we have a SV calling pipeline called PD, and that PD actually is uh, um, is not. Uh, I would say it's not a de novo. So we didn't do much on the aligner. We take. Anything that's aligned longly, that's the best. So you can take that picky and replace it with the best aligner. But the strength of picky is maximize the value of long reads span across the entire structural variation regions and take that read alignment to make a logical SV detection call to tell you whether this is a tendon duplication versus inversion. So this is really the value of PG is in the logic design of looking, look at, looking at those alignments and then understanding the long read nature and calling different structural variations. So the way the different structural variation called by PG are inversion, translocation, tendon duplication, and the insertion deletion, particularly because of complex conformation we can call insertion and deletion happen in the same locus at the same time by PT. Um, so these are the, I, I think the paper is being published. I'm not going to um, spend too much time emphasizing, just saying the performance of nanopore reads, we can validate all kinds of structural variables called by PCR, and their validation rates usually very good. Reads actually, the structural variation covered by two reads are validated almost 100%, 
and valid rate one week are valid rate between 50% to 100%. So it's not really, I think it's a combination between the long read, be able to clearly define our structuration, and the logic that actually we designed to put in the PG to call those reads um, logically. And then taking those validated site uh, structure variation as a gold standard, we ask, well, what did the short read perform with those? We find that short read particularly performed less uh, good in the tendon duplication inversion, which is not the tendon duplication inversion are hard to call by the short read because the way of short read call structure variation. And lastly, we were asked by the reviewer, we have to compare with three, uh, two other structure variation colors with long reads at that time. And basically, three papers almost published uh, within a very short distance. Meaning, actually, this is a problem everybody faced at that time when we do a long read. And everybody started doing those uh, exercises. But in any case, I think the specificity using the known so the true set of the deletion insertion, the PG really performed equally well with other two. But I think the PG definitely performed better in terms of sensitivity because PG caused a lot more insertion and duplication, particularly in the short region. So these are the particular uh, uh, structural variation called by PG are um, the inserts, the span are particularly small. They're small insertion deletions are highly sensitive called by PG. And if you look at the span, they peak around 300 region base pair. Immediately, there's to realize those are repeats. So um, uh, I don't have time to go through the detail, but just saying that those the, uh, extra structure variation called by PG are full of repeats. So suggesting those are underappreciated previously. Um, what does that mean? That means repeat variations are the huge majority of variation in the human genome. So when repeat moves, when repeat duplicate, when repeat translocate, that creates a lot of variation. And what does repeat do in when doing they doing that? They create diversity. They create a different way of regulating genes that actually uh, may be important for gene regulation. Um, like I said, because the way of calling structural variation is long reads, you can exactly know the, where the breakpoint is. So we can study the breakpoint <coughs> uh, characteristics. Um, this is a complex slide. I don't have time to go in. But just saying that by looking at the exact breakpoint, we realize there are micro insertion of non-human sequences in almost between 50% to 14% of uh, structural variations. And then we, not only they have a micro insertion, they also have a micro homology on the junction of repeats. These type of information guide us to hypothesize how the repeats were generated. The repeat will probably generate through some sort of short homology-based repairing, and when that repair, there's a new DNA synthesized um, that's being incorporated in there. So that actually also in, uh, is an interesting hypothesis, can be tested later. Um, last one slide is actually, when we look at the 66,000 breakpoint in the base resolution, we see that those breakpoint junctions are highly correlated with gene density. So when there's a high gene density in the genome, they tend to have a high percent of breakpoint density. And also, when there's so-called interchromosome propensity. So remember in the last session, I, I explained to you, chromatin actually connect in the genome in a very orderly fashion. There's certain chromatin actually connect, and that, that, that connectivity is not random. So when their two chromosomes come together, they call the frequency of they come together called interchromosome connectivity propensity. And that propensity is highly correlated with breakpoints. So we're talking about what? Chicken and egg, whether there's high connectivity create those breakpoints, or there's breakpoints result to measure as a high connectivity. That's an that's interesting question we can study. But this tells you, I'm just showing you, when you understand, when you get a very clear look of breakpoints, what type of things you can study in the genome stability and how the cause of causing genome stability. And lastly, when we look at those breakpoints enrichment across genome, we find that 
particular enriched in the promoter and five point UTR region, suggesting those structural variations should result for dysregulation of gene expression. And as a result of that, taking those genes affected by those breakpoints, we can easily segregate type of tumor we study those structural variations from uh, is a triple negative breast cancer versus not to a triple negative breast cancer, where the control didn't show that. So um, this is confirmed those breakpoints not just random, they actually create a whole pathway of type of genes that are being dysregulated. I don't think I have time to go through my last story of how taking the uh, but um, but I think I show you enough. I hope I um, can excite you enough about putting your effort into this new sequence. Okay, there's a lot of things we do requires a very much computational informatic analysis. When you generate data, how to construct three-dimensional genome structure, how to do a, a structure variation called what's the method we can now call complex structure variation. Um, um, how do we do the normal uh, assemble those cancer genomes so we know exactly how this uh, haplotype specific structure variations. Um, I hope this is something that you can take on and want to feel, feel excited to work about, work, work on this. This, this field definitely requires um, more and more smart, intelligent students to put time in there. Uh, and and I, okay, uh, that, that brings me to my most important slide. Um, uh, this is my group. Um, we run workshop every year. This is right after the workshop. They're still very energetic. Um, uh, this, we did them this year in May. Next year we do, we're going to do in September. We will have two days of seminar and two days of hands-on. We're not going to just show you how to run Nanopore. We're going to show you how to run PacBio or Nanopore. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, a 10X and the Bio Nano. So all the tensor we Technology will be um, taught. Um, our group, we're also looking for computational scientists and then genome technologists if you're interested to move to US. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the traffic here. Sorry, I just ignored your term. But anyway, if you're graduating, thinking about my job, then. and my collaborator, a buddy. You can see we're happy to be here.